Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Cryptocurrent, your host here, Richard Carthon. And today I got a special guest all the way out in San Diego with a very special announcement working on an amazing project. We have met up with Casper Labs. How are you doing today? I am doing amazing today. Thanks for having me on. Of course. Well, as we discussed a little bit ahead of time uh, for everyone listening, uh, this will probably be in the future. But today they're actually launching their mainnet, which is super exciting. I know there's been a lot of build up to get here. So definitely want to dive into that. But before we do, I want to learn more about you. Can you give us some background on yourself? Yeah, certainly. So, you know, unlike a lot of folks in the crypto space, I actually came from traditional software. I've been uh, building, you know, cloud or software as a service solutions in large enterprise companies for about 20 years now. Um, I started working with tech in the early 80s. Won't say how old I am, but you can get a good sense then. I was building computers in my basement with my father. I was one of the first kids in my dorm room to have a, a PC, a, you know, a word processing PC that actually used a tape drive. You know, so this was like way, way, way back when. And uh, yeah, I fell into the crypto rabbit hole in 2017 when I started working with the open source uh, blockchain project and founded Casper Labs with my other co-founders in October of 2018. That's amazing. So, I mean, you've been working in this space. You have plenty of um, experience with this. You know, what was it about blockchain that like piqued your interest and was like, wow, I need to go learn more about this and find a way to, to get involved? Absolutely. Like, you know, when I analyze um, what happened with the internet, I definitely saw an opportunity for blockchain to revolutionize both the legal and financial industries. You know, the internet really turned upside down retail and content delivery, right? So you see all kinds of content, written or digital media, really being transformed from print media. And when I say print media, I'm talking about newspapers, CDs, tapes, uh, and movies, right? And that all went online. It went completely digital. Similarly with retail, went from brick and mortar to e-commerce. And, you know, the financial and legal industries have really emerged from the internet pretty much unscathed. They really didn't see a dramatic, up, you know, uh, upturn, if you want to call it, or, you know, kind of flipping the paradigm upside down on its head as a result of the internet. And the cryptocurrency blockchain technology really has, like I immediately saw the benefit and the opportunity for what it could do for these two industries, but also in a much more egalitarian way, right? Like decentralization and, you know, kind of communities, managing communities is really the way I see the future evolving um, away from this kind of ivory tower, centralized control mechanism. And people are definitely frustrated, right? People are definitely frustrated with the powers that be. They're definitely frustrated of the old guard running things the way they've always run, wanted to run it. And blockchain represents an opportunity to to kind of upend this, if you will, from a very grassroots perspective. And I definitely wanted to be a part of that. Definitely. And you brought up a lot of great points. I mean, one, to be able to go through the dot-com uh, revolution as it was, right? From the, the first PC be, being able to build it in your garage all the way to what became the internet and you know web 1.0 to even seeing web 2.0. And as we move into web 3.0 and, and being a part of that blockchain movement, uh, having lived and experienced those different um, opportunities, you you saw one, you're like, wow, I, I want to build this company, Casper Labs. So can you kind of tell us about that transition and you know what what was the thought behind Casper Labs and, and what has been that journey since initially starting it back in 2018? Yeah, so definitely. So when we decided we wanted to found uh, Casper Labs, myself and my co-founders, we set out that we wanted to build an enterprise services company, much like Red Hat, uh, built on an open source platform. So we knew that we wanted to build an open source protocol, no questions there. We also knew that in the blockchain space that there was space and room for a real professional enterprise services company. And, and I, we knew how to execute on that. I knew how to ex execute on that. The second thing is, as we were building the protocol, we knew that we wanted to build a protocol that would scale without sacrificing security, right? So the Casper protocol absolutely um, does not use probabilistic or statistical security in order to achieve speed, right? So it can process transactions very rapidly, um, but it also has flexibility and, 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 and security, right? So like two thirds of stake has to vote on every single block. You really can't get around that. Um, so from that perspective, we believe the security properties of the protocol are very, very good. Um, and also, you know, so we started off with that. And then as I kind of dug deeper into the other protocols out there in the space and the workflows associated with integrating blockchain technology 
into applications, it became very evident to me that there were a lot of core features that were really missing in blockchain technology that made it usable for enterprise. And when I say enterprise, what am I talking about? I'm really talking about any business or entity. It could be a small startup. It could be a small, you know, very aggressive and enterprising startup to a very large Fortune 100 company. And when you distill down what it takes to build a business that uses technology, there are some things that you absolutely have to have in place whenever you're selecting a platform or protocol to build on, right? And in my you know, professional experience, I was the decision maker, right? I was a senior director of engineering, senior director of quality. I was responsible for making sure software shipped on time with no bugs. Right. And that matters. That's a tall tall task. (laughs) That's right. That's right. So I was responsible for making protocol and platform decisions. I was responsible for making technology decisions and I was responsible for making shift decisions. And so it enabled me to understand the full software development life cycle all the way from concept of a feature or an idea all the way out to where you're fielding customer support requests once you've actually sold that feature. And we wanted to build a protocol that would enable that entire life cycle, right? And we just didn't see that in the other protocols we looked at, right? Um, and, And so when you distill that all down, what does it mean? It means... Contract authors need to have control over their on-chain code. It's really as simple as that, right? The history needs to be immutable. I think we all agree that the immutable history of the blockchain is essential. Is it really essential to actually extend that into the code that you're running on-chain, right? So the Casper protocol is a Turing complete system. You can write smart contracts using WebAssembly, using Rust or TypeScript uh, or AssemblyScript, sorry. Um, But those smart contracts are actually upgradable. So you can version your smart contracts. You can migrate the internal state of your smart contracts. You can do things like administer how your smart contracts are upgraded. You can do other interesting things like have, you know, very flexible and powerful multi-signature with account delegation, account recovery, where you can fulfill a use case like, you say you go to your software provider and you're like, man, I need to get into my account. Something is wrong. I can't fix it with interface. They're like, oh, let me log into your account. We've all done this, right? You go, you call right. AT&T and they, they give me access to your account. Okay, great. You can't do that on a blockchain without sharing your private keys. Right. You just can't do that, right? Our system allows you to do that. You can grant temporary access to your account so they can perform actions on behalf of your account. That's something that we baked in. It's a transaction. It costs a little bit of, Casper in order to do it, but it is possible. It's doable, right? So these kinds of functions are available in the virtual machine itself. Super, super important. It's kind of table stakes. The other thing that's really, really important is this feature that a lot of people outside of professional software shops really don't know about. So if you don't work in development, what we call DevOps or development operations, software quality testing or software engineering, you probably don't know about continuous integration or continuous deployment. And this is literally a software assembly line, right? People commit code into GitHub and there's all these processes that build and test your code. Right. That doesn't work with virtually any blockchain in the space right now. So you can't build your on-chain code along with the rest of your application. You can't test it. Um, You need a full node in order to run it. And Casper doesn't require that. So you can build and run your contracts within an IDE like IntelliJ. That's massively important for the other 20 million developers that haven't been exposed to Web3. This is how they work day in and day out. So when you tell them, well, you've got to write your code in a browser if you're going to use Solidity, they're going to look at you like, what? What is that about? Because that's not the way we write code, right? So um, yeah, I'll pause there because that was like a big mouthful, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, plenty to unpack there and, and wow. Talk about a robust blockchain platform. Um, can definitely, I mean, your experience speaks for itself to, to think as thoroughly as you have through all of the various aspects of where blockchain has been breaking down in various aspects. One that you just, just starting from the end was scalability and, and having, uh, a big, barrier to entry for a lot of developers and people that are trying to get in the space is completely having to change your workflow and how you create things, right? Just like you say, you have to have a full node to be able to do work on it. And, and now you're creating a blockchain where you don't necessarily have to do that. You're kind of in a way, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, it, it sounds like even in a decentralized blockchain, you found a way to create some centralized back doors that still allow for that, um, that's, 
special, like, uh, quick pathway to be able to help um, people as they go through this process instead of basically like go and figure it out and sorry, it's just on the blockchain and now you're gonna have to go undo all these protocols or, or do all these extra steps to try to fix it. You're allowing a, a much more easier and robust way to add some centralized properties to go and make those adjustments faster. Yeah, and it doesn't even need to be centralized, right? Because you have multiple account authorizations. So let's say you've got a DeFi protocol, right? The DeFi protocol has the exact same problems around what we, they call, we like to call governance in the blockchain space, right? right? But governance is really software governance, right? And all software is governed, right? You go to a large company like Amazon, I can promise you there's like five or 10 gates every software update has to go through. They may be automated, but that software goes through a bunch of gates, it goes through a sign-off process, it goes through an approval process. That That's all software governance, right? So DeFi protocols, when you talk about software governance, it's like, who gets to authorize changes? How are those changes implemented? And how are they released, right? And even in a decentralized protocol, you can have multiple actors be authorized to update the software on the Casper protocol. So what that means is that, yeah, you can have central control, but guess what? Like you can update those participants, right? So it's not necessarily a single point of failure. You can have multiple participants be authorized to do that. And you can do it in a very decentralized way. The fundamental thing is that once you put code out there on an immutable blockchain, nobody actually believes software is correct the first time you write it, right? Like, right. and that it never needs to be updated, right? And then if you have a protocol fork, now you've got two versions of your DeFi protocol. So now what, right? So there's like a lot of problems associated with software code immutability. We just don't think that it's the way enterprises are going to adopt blockchain, right? So our goal is to like broaden the adoption of blockchain into businesses of public decentralized blockchain because of the trust properties it brings. So that's been our goal is to really build a product that'll get us there. No doubt. And I mean, again, this is very thoughtful in your approach and how you're going about this. I guess my next question would be, and I know you said it's for like small business that are trying to potentially become enterprise, even to your uh, fortune 100, but um, give me some use cases of, of company that, companies that would come on your platform and be able to utilize Casper Labs um, for their infrastructure or whatever kind of uh, initiatives that they may have going on? Yeah. So right now we are working with IPWE. Um, IPWE is a global, they have basically built a global patent marketplace. Um, they built a real business. They are, they have customers, they have revenue, and they are looking to leverage public blockchain uh, infrastructure to build a global patent registry. And so Right now, it's interesting, like about 5 to 10% of all public patents that are sold are actually sold by somebody that doesn't have the right to sell the patent. Wow. And so we intend on building a, a very easy to use and intuitive chain of custody solution for patents. And we will be working with all the patent offices to actually publish those patents onto the Casper blockchain. And then, and you can imagine then now uh, IPWE can leverage this public data, right? So they, you know, the, those patent offices have relationships with IPWE. They will be, as they register their patents on the public blockchain, they, IPWE will be able to benefit from the canonical owner of that patent. And then that owner of that patent now can prove that they have rights to that patent and then they can transact using that patent, right? And they can transact with that patent on the IPWE uh, blockchain, uh, the IPWE system, right? Using the uh, Casper Labs Global Patent Registry. So we have a lot of use cases that are emerging um, and, and so here's the thing is like my thesis is that businesses have built a lot of technology over the past 20 years, right? There's a lot of code out there. And what they're going to do is they're going to look at their existing applications and say, is there an opportunity for me to increase revenue or reduce risk by using the blockchain as a trust layer, right? And so they're going to carve out a small piece of their application and they're going to say, okay, for this small piece, we're going to put that portion of code on the, on the blockchain. And then we're going to be able to provide additional services to our customers because they'll be able to trust that data or we'll be able to reduce our risk because we're able to canonically prove some piece of information about that data, right? And if you look at IPWE, that's exactly what they've done, right? They're able right. to reduce their risk of selling, of engaging in a patent transaction from an owner that doesn't actually own the patent, right? That's how they've been able to reduce their risk. And, and they're able to provide some more value because the person purchasing the patent has some guarantees right? That they're actually buying it from the real owner. Um, and so you're going to see a lot of use cases like this emerge. Um, this is just about one, but we have about, you know, five or 10 other pilots that are in flight right now um, with, with companies looking to leverage this technology. 
It's amazing. And honestly, that's a really cool use case and makes a ton of practicality uh, to me. Like that's actually an interesting stat that I didn't realize a ton of people trying to sell patents they don't own is sad and scary, but also funny at the same time. It's just like, you it's not even, even malevolent, right? Yeah. Like it's not even malevolent. They just don't know that they don't own it. They don't know that they may have been in breach of their agreement with them because they didn't provide. So contractually, they may think they own it, but they don't actually own it, right? And so eventually I, IP, we will actually also inform, you know, basically be able to build smart contracts to actually help enforce some of these terms and conditions in these contracts, right? So that's that's eventually going to be, you know, uh, you know, phase two of the project. But yeah, very very cool stuff. Absolutely, and you know, on that with with the different use cases that you have, uh, you know, we you announced that you are uh, launching Mainnet. So tell us a little bit more about that and and why that's a big deal. Yeah, gosh. So, you know, the Casper protocol is a public de- decentralized and permissionless protocol, right? So we um, we worked. The Casper Association Casper Association is the one that owns the Casper network. They're the ones that are custodians of the, of the protocol and um, all the tokens that are part of the protocol. And um, they agreed to, you know, for us to release the open source uh, code to the validator set. So we had 56, the association has 56 members in it. The 56 validators are running the network. And yeah, they accepted the software, in, in provisioned the infrastructure, downloaded the software, and this morning launched the, launched the Genesis block. So this morning at eight o'clock, the first block was mined on the Casper protocol. So it's a very exciting day for us. Um, I've been working on the technology for about two and a half years at Casper Labs with a team of about forty developers. So we're very we're very thrilled um, at this big milestone. For sure. Well, again, congratulations. Um, Everyone listening at this time, that means that Casper is good and ready to go. If you want to get more involved, definitely go check that out. And if you're a business looking to grow your enterprise and figure out ways to implement what they have, definitely go check this out. Um, Meta, I just want to kind of shift gears a little bit and kind of just open it up a little bit more widely to um, where uh, things are headed in the blockchain world, right? So in... For even from 2018 to 2021, a lot of things have emerged from um, DeFi space to NFT space to a, bun- a bunch of things, right? Where do you think uh, the globe is headed um, in the world of blockchain? Wow, um, that's, a, that's a big one. Um, you know, my personal feeling is that we will start seeing a lot of um, opportunities and applications that leverage blockchain in a manner that we can start really decentralizing even some like, how do I describe this? You know, for a long time before you had the internet, you had, you know, very much B2C and B2B transactions, right? Business to business, which would be primarily wholesalers selling Mm -hmm. to brick and mortar. And B2C transactions were always the customer walking into what we call Main Street. They would walk in, they would make a purchase. Then you saw the internet come in and you start seeing that kind of becoming more of a mesh, right? It becomes more distributed where now you can start seeing a lot more transactions crossing state lines, right? So the buyer and seller do not necessarily need to be in immediate proximity of one another. It starts spreading out, right? Right. But you still have that a seller, you still have B2C, you still have a buyer and you have a seller. What I see in the future, right, and I don't think it's going to happen right away, but I do see this happening, you know, probably maybe five to seven years. I see B2B. I actually see, I'm sorry, C2C, consumer to consumer transactions, right? Mm. I see like decentralized Uber and decentralized Airbnb, wherein I can find a trusted person that I want to rent my house from, and I don't need an Airbnb in the middle, right? I can choose to transact directly with that individual and I can do it using the blockchain. I can discover them. I can find out what their trust ratings are. I can you know, look at reviews. I can know that it's completely trusted because I don't need a central authority to tell me whether or not they're trusted or not. The blockchain can build that layer of trust for me, right? And then I can complete my transaction directly with them using an escrow process that's all on chain and completely trustless. So right. I see it as being a new, like, you know, consumer to the consumer era of transactions where we can do things like selling the fruit that we grow in our backyard and building reputation for that, you know, wonderful things like that, where we don't need any central authority guiding that. That's really cool. Um, you're, you're actually one of the first to, to put that on my horizon, like a world where you are truly a, a, a consumer to consumer and an and Airbnb without needing Airbnb, right? Or um, an Uber without needing Uber. That is very cool. Um, and I definitely see how blockchain could like build that application and bro- build that trustless transactions, as you just said. Um, 
you've definitely learned a lot over the years with all of the various uh coding languages, and even more so just pouring into blockchain. If you could take all the knowledge that you've been able to gain through the years and impart some of that wisdom to yourself when you're first starting out, what is some of the knowledge that you would impart on yourself? Ooh, that's a really good question. So if I could talk to the me way back when, what would I tell her? Yep. Oh, um, that's a really, nobody's ever asked me that question before. I have to take a second to think about it. Um, gosh. I would tell myself that number one, I should have gotten a CS degree because newsflash, I don't have a computer science degree. It was a big, it was a big debate between my parents. My dad wanted me to go into engineering. My mom wanted me to go to medicine. So I chose the medicine route and I actually had to loop back around into computer science much later in life. So that was one thing I would definitely tell her um, is that, you know, your dad actually knows what he's talking about. You should probably go, go into engineering. That's the first thing. The second thing I probably would say is, um, you know, um, just kind of follow your truths, right? Um, follow your truths. And um, coming into blockchain was a culmination of all of my years of experience. And it, while it may seem like I was taking a detour along the way, I really wasn't. Um, I was gathering up a lot of wisdom and experience in all the variety of different companies that I worked from. I worked at. I worked at a lot of different companies, and. It was interesting because I didn't stay at one company for very long. I kept bootstrapping myself and learning about new verticals and new business models. And it actually wound up being very, very beneficial. Um, Whereas a lot of people may choose to stay at one company for a very long time. I actually am now realizing and recognizing the value of knowing about, you know, many, many, many different business models because I've worked at a lot of different companies and Um, There were times when it became very discouraging because I felt like I had to just learn the ropes all over again when I would start at a new company. Um, So I probably would tell myself, you know, it's all good. You know, you're learning about new business models and in the end, it's really going to pay off for you. Yeah, no, that is some golden advice. Uh, I really do appreciate you sharing that with our audience. And, you know, I I appreciate you sharing all the things that you have today. I mean, this has been very, very knowledgeable for me um, and and, and definitely some great things that I can take uh, away and, and, as I kind of dive even more into the blockchain space, but you know, as we kind of wrap up things here, what is the final thought that you want to leave with all of our listeners? Blockchain is here to stay. And I strongly encourage all of your listeners, if you haven't already gotten exposure to the technology, take some time out to get exposure to the technology. It's a wonderful technology. And there's so many ways you can get involved. Um, You can definitely get involved, obviously, by, you know, saving your money and holding some cryptocurrency, because I do believe it is a harder form of money in the long run. Um, So definitely do try to put some of your earnings, do your research, right? Um, Obviously, learn about the protocols, learn about the technology, because I do believe it's here to stay, particularly if you're younger, right? If you're younger, you definitely want to understand deeply how blockchain technology works, because it is going to be here and form the foundation of your future life. So that's my that's my two cents. It's a great final thought. Thank you for sharing it. Um, Meta, what are some ways that people can learn more about Casper Labs and also connect with you? You can connect with me on Telegram at mparlacar. I'm also available on the Casper Labs Discord. I'm also on Twitter. And you can learn more about Casper Labs, the company at casperlabs.io. And the public network is casper.network. So feel free to reach out, uh, connect with me. Always happy to answer questions and help you out. Amazing. Well, again, thank you so much for joining us today. And for everyone listening, stay cryptocurrent. <music>